Get up on your feet. Father, we reverence you today. Let's go before him in prayer. Let's open our hearts. Father, we reverence you today. We worship you today. And we thank you. I, th I thank you for the phenomenal opportunity to be able to minister your word to this people, Father God. It's the highest honor and the greatest privilege to stand in this place. I humble myself before you today. And Holy Spirit of God, I ask that you use me today to minister, to teach your word with accuracy, with clarity and precision, in love, in, uh, in boldness and authority. And I, as your word goes forth today, I thank you that it goes forth in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I declare today that every ear is open to hear Every ear is open to hear in the name of Jesus. And I pray that each heart will be teachable and coachable. And we're ready to adapt and to make changes, to line ourselves up with your word that we need to. I thank you for continual change and growth and transformation in the lives of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Do you have your Bibles with you? I want to try and finish um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit because I really want to be able to get on the series I've been doing. If you haven't, um, I guess they'll package them together, but you can um, pick them up from the bookshop. But um, I want to get on to the gifts of the Holy Spirit um, because I believe this is a season that we're getting ready to walk into where we see greater manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Um, Pastor touched on it today, and as, as Pastor was up here speaking, um, uh, the Holy Spirit dropped something into my heart. You know, we talk about, we hear lots of messages going around in churches around the world on grace, um, but it's not preached, it's preached in the context that you can pretty much do anything, and because of God's grace, you're good. That's not the truth. We're in a dispensation of grace because one of the things is when the, when the glory of God comes in, and the Bible said that in the last days that God was going to pour, He is going to pour out His Spirit. When, when, the, when God pours out His Spirit in that way, when the manifestation of God's glory falls, nothing that is unclean can stand in, in His presence. And the grace that we're in now and the messages that we're hearing to clean up our acts, to sort ourselves out, is to prepare us so that when the glory of God falls in the house, we can still be, we can remain alive. Can you say amen? When the glory of God fell in the church, and Ananias and Sapphira died. Ask your neighbor, do you want to die in church? Is this a good place to die? <laughs> Amen. So don't come to the house of God and think you can walk into God's presence, into his house, where his glory can show up at any degree or any level on any given day. Don't have the audacity to think you can come in with sin in your life and you're going to walk out okay. There will come a day when God's glory begins to fall in this place. And we've seen it before where people ran out of church. You don't want to be running that way. You want to be running this way. Can you say amen? So today we're going to talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be speaking, it's basically the fruit of the Holy Spirit is character. Character. The part of us that needs to be renewed, the part of us that needs to change, the character that the fruit of the Holy Spirit depicts is the character of God. And we are to become more and more like God. Um, we're not supposed to remain the same. One of the attributes or the greatest characteristic of God's personality is that God is loving. We heard about love last week. We heard about love on Wednesday. I think I touched on love. Um, but we've been hearing about love. So one of God's characteristics, and if we say we're children of God, there should be a greater manifestation of God's love flowing out of us in the way we are towards people, the way we treat people. There should be a manifestation of love if that fruit is being developed in you because that is a character of God. One of the other things, are the characteristics that is really prevalent about God is that God is a giving God. And if you're, if you're not a giving person, if you're tight, you're stingy, you're mean, 
then that characteristic is not, um, is not evident that that's been developed in you. So one of the characteristics of God, I can cook until I'm tired. You know, one of the things I did when I went home last time, first thing I did was run um, on Friday night, I ran a bath with, um, put bath salts in there because, you know, standing for, I don't know how long we stood for, about five hours, four or five hours, we're standing in the kitchen. That messes up my back. But you know what? When you've got the heart, heart of God, God, you give and you don't do it grudgingly. That's why the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. God doesn't want you to give begrudgingly. And if you, if you're not, if you, whatever you do, if you don't do it with love and you don't do it, uh, be happy in doing it, you, you've not developed that, um, that part of God, that giving part. Some of you are mean. Mean, mean, mean. Mean. And let me just say this. Some of, some of you, it doesn't matter what anyone tells you, you're not going to change. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those that want change. So those of you, it doesn't matter if Jesus came and stood nose to nose with you, you're not going to do anything. You're just going to stay the way you are. That's fine. You stay the way you are. But I'm talking to the people today that want to change. I want, I'm talking to people that want to resemble their daddy. That daddy. Can you say amen? And the greatest part of God's character is he's a giving God. If you're not a giving person, you're not, manifesta- you're not manifesting the character of your daddy. If you're just a taker, who's going to bless you next? Who's going to give to you next? You don't have the character of God. God's character is love and is giving. For God so loved the world, he gave, and he gave his best gift. You know, I, I was looking at some of the stuff that, we, um, that was given for the jumble sale, and that wasn't some of your best. That was what you, it was embarrassing. I saw stuff that I'm like, you'd need to fumigate. I'm being honest. You knew that you, that the, the, place that that stuff some of that stuff should have gone should have been in the bin not even the charity shop come on who's gonna buy that could we couldn't give it away for free what kind of heart is that you know what we should have done go and buy something i said the character and nature of god is giving we gave what we didn't want We gave away what was insignificant. We gave away what really wasn't even going to wear again. The heart of the father, the character of our daddy is the character of giving. And we've got to cultivate that on purpose. Stop being such a meanie. Mean with your attitude. You can't even be kind with your words. Be kind. Give words of encouragement. Give. Words of encouragement, give. Words of affirmation, give. Are you getting it? Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. So I'm going to try and get through. This is really going to be a challenge, but I'm going to try and get through the remaining eight. Um, A few weeks ago, I spoke on love, so that was one. But I'm going to try my best to get through. If I don't, then we'll um, continue it on on another occasion. But... Understand this, that the Bible is not meant to condemn us, but it is designed to change us. Don't posture yourself like someone is telling you off. The Bible is designed to change you. Change is challenging. It's not condemning, it's challenging. It's saying that you need to Deal with some things in your life. You need to make adjustments in your character. The way you talk to people, the way you treat people, the way you are on the inside, there needs to be adjustments made. We have to align ourselves with this book. So it's not condemning, it is challenging you. Amen? So the Word of God is not there. Yes, it will make you feel uncomfortable, especially if you're uncomfortable when the Word is speak, that is a good place that you need to make a note, a big circle around it, and say, that's an area I need to work on. Because if something doesn't affect you, it shouldn't make you uncomfortable. 
You can talk about fornication, you can talk about lust, you can talk about adultery till the cows come home. I'm not going to feel no ways because it doesn't affect me. But if you're getting upset um, when things like that are mentioned, it's because you need to deal with that. Come on. And you know what, church? We pretend a lot. I said we pretend a lot. We pretend we are so good. And we got, you know, Pastor talked about that, the secret stuff. It's not secret. Why isn't it secret? Because Father God knows. Every angel knows because they were watching. Devils know because they were there rooting you on. And then came to condemn you when you finished. Hello. So you had an audience. It'd be like you doing your thing, you're sleeping around, and we're all, the whole church is watching you. <laughs> Next time, just picture that in your mind. Amen. Are you good? So next time you're sleeping with somebody that you have no right, say no right, no legal right, no legal right, what's the legal right? You are married by law, not by culture or tradition, not because you jumped a broom, but you have the legal papers to say you're married to them. Then you have the right, you can sleep with each other 24-7. You can be on and off every five minutes. It's entirely up to you. We're all adults here, right, this morning. If that's your... (laughs) Make sure you check. (laughs) Make sure you check whoever you're going to marry. If they're like every five minutes. If they're like little rabbits, then you better check, girls. Because in our minds, we think, you know, once a month. (laughs) You know how women think, once a month. (laughs) <laughs> maybe if you're really good once a week that's how we think guys those that, those that married you're keeping quiet but you know you've been under manners so you, some of you married men that's why some of you look so miserable <laughs> why am I here this has got no, you, you're miserable Always grouchy, he's always angry. Let me give you a revelation, women that are married. You can't expect the brother to be happy when you've got the shop shut. If you're married... There's only one reason, one reason, married ladies, what's the one reason? Fasting. And you don't declare it. You get permission. Is it okay, honey? I'd like to fast. And you know, you're not going to be fasting every minute. You're secret eating and then you're telling the man you're fasting. Let's get back to the word. Tell your neighbor, open the shop. (laughs) Open the shop. If you wanted to have a shut shop, you should have stayed single. If you don't like that stuff, single ladies, stay single. Why would you put a man through that level of torture? That is not a giving spirit. And I don't care what your excuse are. You go to the doctor if you need to. But sort yourself out. Hmm. Someone needed that slap. Sort yourself out before someone comes and does your job for you. Just because, ooh, did I say that? Did I say that? <laughs> Girlfriend, he ain't all that saved. He's not that saved. That you can shut shop indefinitely. 
He's not that saved. You go on. No counsel. This is your counsel. Open the shop. Burn the jammies. One is that is a sin. That grieves, that grieves God. You need to get rid of that stuff. And anyway, come back. <laughs> I know I can feel you. You're, I just feel you're twisted. You got to fix. You got to love me. You got to love me. I know you're just upset with me right now, but you got to love me. I'm to, I'm trying to save your marriage. Sort yourself out. Go get clipped and groomed and all the bits and bobs and just. I'm flowing with the Holy Ghost. You're seeing me. It's a, I'm yielded right now to the Holy Spirit and that's what he does. And even though it's in humor, it's a serious thing. And, you know, the whole, uh, the, when we get into talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you'll understand what I do every week. I connect with the Holy Spirit. So when I speak, it's my vessel that's being used, but it's, it's his voice that speaks to me. No one told me your business except the Holy Spirit. No, your friend or whoever, and I'm not here speaking about your business, but the Holy Spirit speaks to us all individually, and we, yes, we're hearing a message on the Holy Spirit, but he's, he's revealing himself, and that's how he does. He, he speaks to us in order that we may change. So we're talking about change this morning, and we need to change in our marriage, ladies. We need to change. Pastor says it to me like this. He said, what's the point of having a Ferrari, and it's just parked up in the garage? Can you say amen? That must be frustrating. You want to take that thing out and you want to go out on the road and you want to drive it. What's the point of having a nice handbag or a nice pair of shoes? I'm speaking to you ladies on a level you may understand. You've got a nice new outfit and it just hangs in the wardrobe. You want to wear it. Well, same thing with your husband. He married you and he came... It, marriage came with a, he had in his mind that he's entitled to have intimacy with you whenever. Whenever. Amen. So in the bedroom, you lose the halo. Moving right along. Don't let someone else come and do your job for you. Yeah, Lord of mercy indeed. That's what you'll be saying. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that needed to have been said. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, For everyone is a new, everyone, if, everyone, if anyone, sorry, is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I'm just, the Holy Spirit is still prompting me, tiredness is not an excuse. And someone is like, really, you are messing with my message today. Ty I heard you. Tired. Go take some vitamins. Go buy some iron. The chemist is 24-7 next door. Go and sort yourself out. Tiredness is not an excuse. Stop making excuses. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. When we're born again, we go through transformation from being the person we were, the worldly person, 
to being, there's a transformation taking place where we were once worldly, but there should be a change to how we were, to who we are becoming on a daily basis. It's called change. It's called transformation. It's called the, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, God's character. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and perfect, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So we go through the process of transformation and change. We never, until Jesus comes back, arrive at the place where we are perfect. We're moving on to perfection and we're working on our characters, our mindset, the things we do, how we, how we live, how we conduct our lives. But there should be an ongoing process of change in you as an individual. I've seen a lot of people, a lot of Christians who become stuck you, because you feel you're good. You feel you know what you need to know. You feel you've arrived at where you need to have arrived. I'm here to tell you, you have not. And you need to, the moment you think you've arrived, you stop learning, you stop growing, you stop changing. Can you say amen? There's some people, I don't even bother to, to, to say anything to them because it doesn't matter what you say, they're just not going to do it. And when you get to that place, when you arrive at that mindset, guess what? You've, you've stopped, you've stunted everything in your life of where you should be. So just remain in a place where you're being changed or you're, you're being transformed on a regular basis. You know, the things that we go through, the trials we go through, the circumstances that we go through in life, that's all part of the things that God sends to help you because change doesn't come just sitting there. Change comes when you have opportunities to apply the word, when you're in situations and you're being challenged in a particular area. That's a perfect spot to develop the fruit of the Spirit. When your patience is being tried, perfect place to develop long-suffering. Can you say amen? It doesn't just happen for, no, for just sitting there and not being in challenges. Challenges shape us and they change us. Supposed to change us for the good so that the godly character comes out. You say amen. So the Holy Spirit has a major role in transforming the Christian into one who is like unto God. So we're supposed to be transformed by working and cooperating with the Holy Spirit. So developing the fruit of the Spirit in us is the transformation we undergo. That's a huge job for, for the Holy Spirit. Would you not agree? That is a massive job trying to change us. But you know what? He's been at this for over 2,000 years. And he's, he's changed believers through time. So we're not impossible. Can you say amen? Are you impossible? But you know what? He needs your willingness and he needs your cooperation. I remember hearing this statement many years ago, and the statement was, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he'll not force himself on you, and he'll not force you to do anything you don't want to do. And I realized from that time, as I began to be sensitive of how I responded to him, and I realized that he w waits for my permission. He waits for my invitation. He's been given to us, but he's not going to do things to us that we don't invite him to. Um, even to basic things, I've asked the Holy Spirit to help me when it came to, um, I found myself in a new job that I felt was very challenging. I never understood it. I knew I couldn't do it in my own ability. And the Holy Spirit's there the whole time. I remember one particular job I had in advertising when I was living in America, and I sat there for two weeks like I haven't got a clue what to do. And it wasn't until I came to the end of myself, the whole time the Holy Spirit was there, but it wasn't until I came to the end of myself and I said, Holy Spirit, help me. 
The moment I prayed that, it was like someone downloaded information into me to the extent that everyone thought I'd been in advertising for years and years and years. And it was, it was available, the change was available. I said the change was available the whole time, but I didn't invite him. Your change is available, but you've got to cooperate with him. You've got to be willing. You've got to ask him to help you. You know, instead of dealing with your anger all the time, you get angry. You get angry. How about asking the Holy Spirit to help you? Now the help may not come the way you think it will. You know, help me, Holy Spirit is not going to just zap it out of you. Something's going to happen that causes that anger to rise up and you've got to deal with it according to the word. That's how it works. You know, he's not going to just suddenly remove anger, but then the opportunity arises still. But next time I'm not going to react. And next time I'm not going to react. And next, and you know what? After a while you'd have conquered that thing and that fruit will begin to grow and bud in your life. Can you say amen? So we need to be willing and we need to cooperate and we need to invite him. We're to walk in the newness of life that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. If you turn there with me, Romans chapter 6 from verse 1, Paul talks about this newness of life that we're supposed to walk in. That means when you get born again, you've got to begin to walk. You can't stay where you are. You can't stay unchanged. You can't feel like, well, I'm good. I come to church. I work in church. And let me just say, you know, some people come to church and even those that are out in the overflow, we come and we're, ba- we're watching baby and we're chatting. You need to listen. Even those that are behind the scenes, you're working. You need to listen. Because there's nothing worse than coming to church and you justify that I'm in the house of God, but you heard nothing. Some of the most unchanged people are the ones that work in church. So I'm talking to work. You haven't arrived because you have a position as an usher or you help in the kitchen or you're on the sound. You still need the same word as everyone else. So listen, pay attention with the attitude to change. Tell your neighbor you need to change. And tell someone else, I need to change more than you. Because you enjoyed saying that one. But every one of us in this room, every one of us, I said every one of us needs to change. We need to fix up and we need to scrub up. Are you in Romans chapter 6? From verse 1, it says, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. 
And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. So we are, in, we are to put off the old man. We are to put off the old sinful nature. And the reason many of us struggle with this walk, walking uprightly before God, the reason many of us struggle in our Christian walk is because we are trying to do the world and do God. If I'm, try, if I'm still living after the old man, I can't do God at the same time. I can't be my old man and be a new man. It doesn't work. It's one or the other. Now, some, of, some people in here, probably under the sound of my voice, some of you think, well, if I come to church, this is your fire insurance. Do you know what I mean by fire insurance? You think by attending church, the Bible said that God is a mocked. Attending church does not secure your place in heaven. I just need to tell you that because you might be, you might have persuaded yourself that way and you're going to wake up one day, like Pastor said, you may not wake up. You want to make sure that you're in the right place when you wake up on the other side. Can you say amen? Church isn't, attending church isn't your fire insurance. Changed life is. A transformed life is. A renewed, the Bible says it this way, work out or work on. Your salvation with fear and trembling. Can you say amen? So don't use God and don't think God's an idiot. Can you say amen? God's not your fool. He'll not be mocked. Is this, is this okay? Is it, remember, this isn't to condemn you. This is to help you. Because you need to change. You need to change. We need to change. Can you say Amen. We have to constantly strive. Do you think this has been easy for any of us? No. no. But we make a decision. Starts there, right there. Decision. That's it. I'm done with the old. That's, what, that's, that's where I started. I'm done with the old. I closed. There's some bridges I burned because I had no plans to cross back over. Can you say amen? Some of you still got your bridge and you're, uh, you leave here today and you run back over the other side of the bridge. You have to burn some bridges. There's some places you don't need to ever revisit. You don't need to ever go back there. And if the people you left back there want to meet with you, they have to cross to you. Can you say amen? We justify the reason we keep going back into the places that we, God delivered us from. We justify that we need to go back to evangelize. When did you evangelize them? Seriously, we, we, we justify that in our mind. But when you go back there, you do what they do. You puff in on that stuff. The Holy, the, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, he begins to confirm his word. You puff in your gunja. Hello. And there ain't no difference. You don't look different. You don't act different. And instead of helping them to come to Christ, you're now a hindrance and a stumbling block. And you think you want to be cool. You want to be cool. You want to be cool. What's cool? What's cool? They actually disrespect you. Because they see you as weak. I remember one time, there was this, um, he was a rapper. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. He was a rapper, he got saved and um, was preaching. And I don't even hear about him anymore. I don't even know what's happened to him. But I remember watching um, one of these music premiere things. This was years ago. And he was, um, he wanted to go, he went back. And he was trying to suck up to P. Diddy and all these other guys. And they all disrespected him till, on TV. It was embarrassing. 
You think those that you, you told them you go, you go into church now and you go back there and you want to hang with them and look cool with them. You don't want to act too religious and you want to make out you're still cool. They disrespect you. You lost their respect. They would have a higher respect for you if you'd stuck to your guns. For real. They see you now as a fool. And you think, they smile in your face, but behind your back, they do not respect you. Someone needed to hear that. Hey, hey. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is on you today. Can you say amen? And don't leave because we'll all know. And the cameras, I will point you and the camera will spin around and put you up here. But he's in your business today because you need to change and stop your nonsense. Stop your nonsense. What have you got back there? What has back there ever done for you? Apart from make you a fool and cause you to make foolish decisions? How long do you think God's going to protect your behind? Ooh, did I say that? Yes, I did. So how do we walk in the Spirit and be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit? The answer is we walk according to the Spirit's directions and instructions, and we're sensitive to His leading. That means every day I've got to acknowledge Him, and I've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what He's wanting to do in my life. I've got to be open for Him to change. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. So every day, I've got to invite the Holy Spirit. Remember, I said to you, you've got to be willing. You've got to cooperate with Him. You've got to invite Him. So every day, Holy Spirit, I invite you to, to bring about the change in me that needs to be brought about, the, what your Spirit would have changed in me. Take away what's in me that displeases you and build in me the character that pleases God. Do you know there's things that we do because we do it in our old way, our old nature, our old sinful nature, that grieves God. Do you ever think about that? That the things we may do sometimes grieves God? Sometimes the way we treat one another, that grieves God? The things, the foolish things that come out of our mouths grieves God? So I don't want to grieve God, so Holy Spirit help me. Help me to, to talk right. Help me to bear the fruit. And any areas that needs developing in me, Holy Spirit, I give you liberty to do your work in me. Amen. John 15, 8 says, But by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. God is glorified when we're bearing fruits of righteousness. It says that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So we glorify God when we're changing. We glorify God when we are being transformed to look like him. So when I'm acting after my old self, my old nature, I don't bring any glory to God. So God is glorified as fruit begins to manifest and um, his character begins to show out in us. And one of the incredible things that I love with, what I, you know, the gardening club that we do is that you begin to see manifestations of what you've sown. And it's not just enough to sow them, but we are diligent to nurture um, what is being, what we've planted because we're cultivating it. And we've got to just, not just think, well, I'm, you know, love, love, love. I've got to cultivate it. That means I've got to find things to do that it shows and demonstrates love. You cultivate. So if I'm, if I want to learn the spirit of generosity or kindness, I have got to do the things that pertain to that fruit cultivate it and every time um, things pop up the worms and the caterpillars and the bugs my attitude I've got to I've got to get rid of them because they'll spoil you get that that unforgiveness that bad attitude the t gossiping is going to spoil that which I'm trying to cultivate in my life can you say amen so we talked about love. So the second fruit of the um, fruit of the Spirit is joy. Let me clarify, joy is not happiness. Joy is not happiness. 
Happiness is based on outward things. Happiness is based on, oh wow, someone just blessed me with something. That's subject to change because tomorrow I'm back to being miserable. So joy is not happiness. Happiness is based on things. It's, it's based on outward things. God's joy, on the other hand, is abiding. It is something that is on the inside of you that it doesn't matter what you go through, the joy of the Lord remains inside of you. It's not an emotion. It's something that is on the inside of you. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So I can't... I. You know, that makes sense to me that it's important that I cultivate and nurture joy because there's times that I'm going to need the strength that joy supplies. Can you say amen? There's times I'm going to go through stuff that I need strength. You know, when your joy is gone, you're going to get weak. And when you're weak, you're going to be susceptible to things that you would have ordinarily been able to carry or walk through. So it's important that we cultivate, cultivate. Do you understand the word cultivate? We, um, those in the gardening club understand this. That means every day I go and check. I check, I check what I've sown, I check what I've planted, I weed around it, I remove, and it doesn't matter how much I've cleared the weeds, I'll go back in a few days, new weeds, weeds of bad attitude, weeds, all kinds of weeds begin to spring up to try and choke that which I've planted. So every day, we've got to check our hearts. We've got to check our characters and we've got to weed out things that may be trying to work against that which we're trying to grow in our lives. Amen? So joy is a byproduct of our relationship with God. So the joy of the Lord, we say the joy of the Lord, it comes, it's a byproduct of your relationship with God. The, the way you cultivate, the way you develop joy, you have to spend time with God. It is a byproduct of your relationship with God. Joy is a byproduct. It comes by means of spending quality time with God. The more time you spend with God, the more time you spend in His Word, the more His Word you put on the inside of you, joy begins to now. That's the seed. Spend time with God. Guess what? I'm cultivating joy because I get to the place where I know God because I spent time with Him. So when things look adverse, as they do sometimes, because I know God, I know he's got me. I know he's good to his word. I know he's good to his promise. And because I spend time with him, cultivating that, I don't lose my joy when, when suddenly... Something comes into my life that was unexpected. So spend time with God if you want to cultivate joy. Many of us don't spend quality time with God. That's why we're so quick. When, we, when something happens, we have no joy to stand on. There's no joy to hold us up. And we fall apart instead of standing strong. And when we fall apart in times of trouble, it's because you've not spent time with God. That's the reality. We don't fall apart. We fall apart based on I've not been spending quality time with God. So my joy is based on my relationship or it is a byproduct of my relationship or time spent, quality time spent with God, me and God alone. So if we can remember every day what Jesus has done for us, what he has given us, joy will absolutely abound in and through us. Every day remind yourself of what he's done for you. Every day, remind yourself of what he's given you, the many blessings. Joy in the life of a Christian, it should be a constant presence in our lives. We should be, we should be the most joyful people, shouldn't we? We have much to be joyful about. Christians should be the most joyful people. Nothing should really faze us. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Always, not that I'm rejoicing over the bad stuff that's come into my life, but when I can rejoice despite what it looks like. 
That's my opportunity right there to cultivate. Oh my gosh, look at the news that I just got. But you know what? I'm going to rejoice in you, Father God. I'm going to begin to worship. I'm, I don't just worship on a Sunday morning. I worship. Gosh, I just got a, really, a, a letter. I just got told that I've been made redundant. You know what? I'm going to find myself a little corner and I'm going to begin to worship God. What did Job do when Job got report after report? Your kids have been killed. All your wealth is gone. Your houses are gone. Everything that you own is gone. Job bowed himself. He rejoiced in God. Why? Job had a relationship with God. And Job knew God. And Job was able to go through such atrocities of disaster because he had joy. Can you say amen? So it comes from spending time with God. Next time you get bad news, next time you get bad diagnosis, next time you get fired, it could have just been your own laziness that it was brought upon by yourself. But next time something bad happens in your life, hit your face and begin to worship. Amen. Cultivate joy. Find joy in, your, in our association, find joy in that we're able to come together in the house of God. What a blessing this is. To have somewhere to come and worship like this. This is a blessing. Can you say amen? Find joy in difficult circumstances. I'm not focusing on the circumstance, but I'm focusing on the bigness and the awesomeness of my God. James 1, 2 to 4 tells us, my brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into various, 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 various trials. What's various? Just about anything. Just about anything. When you find yourself in various, just about anything trials, count it all joy. Can you say amen? That's, you know, you notice when God's word is so, God's way of reacting to things is so opposite you know, the, the world says, keep just in case of a rainy day, you may not have enough tomorrow. God says, give away. The world says, do, do this this way. When something bad happens, worry, panic, take, take things into your own hands. But God says, rejoice. How foolish does that sound? But you know what? It works. God's word works. I said, God's word works. Find joy. 1 Peter 4, 13 says, But rejoice to the extent that, you, that you're partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. So joy is necessary, church. You must cultivate it in your life daily on purpose. The third one is peace. Who needs peace? We all need peace. We live in a world today that if you switch on the news, there's everything to destroy peace. There's fighting, there's wars. I was watching, um, it actually popped up on my phone yesterday morning. A young girl, I don't know who she was, but apparently she won the voice. I presume it was an American voice. It was in America. You know, young girl, she's obviously just starting out, signing autographs and some lunatic comes up and shoots her. She died. Um, which is terrible. You know, that's an awful thing. When you're reading stuff like that, there's a lot of lunatics. Some of them may be sitting next to you. We don't know what mental condition. They call it bipolar. You're mad. You're unpredictable. Hello. That's the world we live in. Ask your neighbor, you bipolar. We got all these fanciful words. You know, in the old days, it was either you're mad. They used to call it a mental asylum. Remember that? We, it's all, we're all politically correct now. You can't say that. Ask the person next to you, are you bipolar? <laughs> are you mad? Are you mental? You know what? When we, the way we carry on... <laughs> The way we carry, do you know when you're angry and you lose it, you're having a moment of insanity. Right there, right there you're mad. In every given word, you're mad. Because you lost your mind. <laughs> you lost your mind, right? Because you know when you're angry, it doesn't, some people get so angry they're blind. 
That may be you. You're so angry, you actually don't even know what you lose control. You're having a moment of insanity. Don't practice it. You might have a permanent moment of insanity. We may have to section you. <laughs> so we need peace. We live in a crazy world today. Peace is a wonderful gift to possess. Jesus, Jesus shared it in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you. It's given to us. Peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. It's this kind of peace that my heart doesn't become afraid. It's the kind of peace where my heart is not troubled. It's, it's the kind of peace that there is an absence of fear in my heart. That's a peace that transcends understanding. It's the kind of peace that it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm not even moved from my position. There's times when I've gone through things and I, you would never, you know, Pastor always says, um, you may know, maybe I show more emotion than him, so I'm not claiming that one. But you don't know when I'm um, going through some challenging times sometimes. I'm not missing church. I don't care what's going on. By me staying home, what changes? But some of, us, some of us are so foolish. Well, this is going on in my life, pastors. I'm staying home. What nonsense. What kind of foolishness is that that you convince yourself with? You know what? I need to find myself in the house of God where the answer may come to me. Can you say amen? I've, come to, I've been in church. I, I, it doesn't affect my worship. It doesn't affect my church attendance. And it doesn't affect my relationship with God, whatever's going on in my life. Some things are going on that, not now, but I've had times when I've been in church. And there's things in the natural, I should have been pulling my hair out. There's things I've gone through that I should have been, you know those moments where you feel like, you're so frustrated or it's just so awful that you can pull your hair out. But I choose to focus. And do you know what? Every single time he works it out. He works it out. I've seen it over and over and over again. That, that if I'd given, given, given my time to losing my peace over what's going on, that would have been a waste of my time. I would have lost a moment of enjoying God's peace because I was so focused on what's going on over here. That should teach us a lot. When things are going on, when drama is going on in your life, and the drama may not be you, it might just be the people that is in your life, family. Situations, you get phone calls, uncle so-and-so, auntie so-and-so, grandmother, whoever. What am I doing running over there? I will come later. I'm not saying that to be facetious or, or insensitive. But if I, you know, God forbid, I'm believing for my parents have a very, very, very long life. But if I got a phone call this morning while before church started, I'm here. If I got a phone call, I'll come after church. And it was quiet in the house of God. Because most of us wouldn't. Jesus, when he got, the, he got the message, Lazarus is dead. He was operating in that kind of peace. Lazarus is dead. Jesus tarried even longer. Some of us run over and we're not even running with any faith. But you're going here, you come anyway. You're the next wailing woman or wailing mum. You, you're going over there, but you're not bringing faith. You're not running because you're, gonna, you're planning to just throw everyone out the room and lay hands on them. I'm being real. You're running there and you're, just, you, you're running in fear. They don't need you. Stay where you are. They don't need you. 
You're not, add, you're not adding to the situation. You're taking away. Unless you're in faith, stay where you are. Unless you're going there and you're going to speak faith or you're going to lay hands, stay where you are. Come to church, get built up in some faith and then go. Amen. That one went down like a lead balloon. Peace. Peace, the ability to trust God. And stop looking at your circumstances and, your, and looking at yourself. You can't change one iota without God. Can you say amen? So let's learn to develop and cultivate the peace of God. Peace, invo- peace involves peace with God when justified by faith. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, by supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So if there's a situation, the first person I consult is God. The first person I talk to is God. I go to him and I bring in order, not um, crying and wailing in doubt and fear, but I bring before God the supplication. Father, this is the news that I received. This is, this is a posture of faith. God, this is the news I've just received. I bring this before you. And Father, I speak over this situation and I ask for life. I ask for well, if it's something to do with health. Father, I pray and I, and I pray and I release my faith for health and healing and long life. And then I begin to thank God for it. Doesn't that line me up in a better place? So when I come out of that place where I prayed and I put it before God and I petitioned God, supplicated God and I thanked him for it, I can now walk out in faith. Instead of we doing it the other way around, we run around like headless chickens. Can you say amen? We have peace with God so we don't need to be anxious or stressed about anything. And whatever the situation, learn to bring things to God in prayer, in supplication, And thanksgiving. And here's the faith part. Leave it with God. Whatever the outcome. This is what I do. This is where my faith is. I do what I know to do. And I leave it with God. He knows better. So even if the outcome isn't what I've prayed for. I'm good. May not be what I like. If it's different to what I want. But I'm good. Because I've left it with God. We need to learn to leave some things alone with God. Are you getting something out of this? The fourth one, long suffering. It's probably as far as we're going to get today. Long suffering or patience. Long suffering, the spirit produces, literally means long tempered. It's the opposite of short tempered. It's patience, it's forbearance, it's long-suffering, it's slowness in avenging wrongs. So you shouldn't be trying to avenge wrongs. It is the opposite of anger and it is associated with mercy and it's used by God, especially towards us. So long-suffering, when we talk about long-suffering, it's not just waiting As many of us like to think, well, long-suffering is learning to wait. It means it's the opposite of being short-tempered. It means forbearing with one another. It means having patience with one another. Hello. It means being slow to avenge wrong. It's the opposite of anger. And it's it's associated with mercy. So in my long-suffering... I need to learn to extend mercy to you. Are you doing good? It's necessary if we desire God to be long-suffering towards us. Who needs God to be long-suffering towards them? We all do. I need God. I'm sure I frustrate God. I remember when I was frustrating the grace of God when God wanted me to do something and I didn't want to do it because it was, um, it was out of my comfort zone. And I knew that I knew I was frustrating the grace of God. Did you know you can frustrate God's grace in your, on your life? So we need that kind of long-suffering. We need to extend it to others 
in the measure we want to get it back. And you may think, well, I'm not that irritating. Yeah, you are. You know one of the things that helps me? I, 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 you know, this helps me to stop being judgmental of who's got to put up with me. And, you know, if you can switch it around, it will help you. I think about, um, I know I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an easy, you know, some of you young guys may be like, I want a wife like Pastor Erica. You don't. <laughs> you don't. You really don't because I'm challenging. I'm not, I, I like to cook. I, yes, I, I love passionately, but I am challenging. I'm full on. I'm full on. <laughs> You, you would be walking on tiptoes. I'm full on. I exp- my, my level, my level that I would expect you to perform at as a man is up there. So before you say you want a wife like me, you better get your behind up there. Because we want and we don't match. <laughs> we, want, we want this wife talking to you men, you want this wife that's up there, but you're down here. Come on, you're down here. Lower, lower, you're down here. You don't pray, you're down here. You can't make decisions. Hello. Oh, you're not, lo- you're not loving me right now, brothers. You thought I was just going to give the girls a hard time, you were going to get away with it. You want this woman up here, you want her to have everything going on. How about you? How about you? You don't tithe? Well, where are you going? Putting in a request like that. You're a non, you're non-giver, you're mean. You, you have no faith. You're faithless. You're fraidy, fraidy, can't make decision. What am I going to do, fight for you? Wouldn't that be weird if I have to defend my husband? We go out anywhere and it's like, I, I've, excuse me, I'm falling apart. <laughs> I've got a dress on, so it's okay. Wouldn't it be weird if I'm out with my husband and someone comes to attack us and he runs behind me? <laughs> you have no business. You have no business. <laughs> Let me just say it again. You have no business. Wanting a wife, and you, she's got to protect you. you. You need to go and man up. No business. Hmm. I'm getting ad libs from down there. But you know, we want something and we're down here. Some uneven balance. If you want this amazing woman that can cook, clean, she swings from the chandelier in the bedroom, all that stuff, you better raise your bar, brother. You better raise your value. You better get some vision in your eyeballs. Some of you, got, you can't even see beyond the end of your nose and you want a wife. Stay by yourself. Do us all a favor. Where are you leading me? Come on, I'm talking real stuff. Where are you leading me? I would be so frustrated if I was married to a man with no vision. You would drive me, well, I would drive you crazy. That's how it would work. I would drive you crazy because I, I can't live with a man with no vision. I need a man that's driven. Come on, girls. Don't shortchange yourself. You need a visionary. Most of us are like, well, you've got two legs. No, it's not good enough. You need to be able to see. And you need to be able to have um, ambition. You need to have goals. You need to have, be able to take me and any kids that come in our relationship, take us somewhere. Not down. And the same way. See, some of you are clapping. The same way you found me, you better be able to maintain. Don't even be looking if you can't maintain or take this up a notch or two. Go back to your boys. Do what you do with your boys and be a boy. <laughs> Are we good, brothers? 
Some of you saying that looking at me. <laughs> you still love me. Yeah, no choice. I'm your mama. <laughs> you gotta love your mama. Where were we? Long suffering. How did we get over into talking about this? You lot are pulling out some serious stuff today. It's necessary if we desire God to be long-suffering towards us. Remember the scripture in Matthew 18, 32 to 35, when um, with a servant who God was merciful and gracious to him, and he did not extend the same back to his fellow servant. In verse 32, it says, And his master, after he'd called him, said to him, You wicked servant, you wicked servant, I forgave you all this debt because you begged me. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay the debt. So it's necessary to maintain the unity of the spirit is to develop um, a spirit of long suffering. People who are often angry have little or no control over their anger or their emotions. They lack this in their characteristics. We overcome anger and bad temper through love. Amen. We pray. We, we extend long suffering. We extend restraint. We extend self control. We stop losing it. Tell your neighbor, stop losing it. You can't afford to. And we need to stay in control. Can you say amen? Stand to your feet with me today. I'm going to stop there. I don't think you can take any more of me today. <laughs> was I enough for you today? I think I was more than enough. <laughs> That's what my husband has to live with. You lot all like, God, Pastor, you're so blessed. You're so blessed. You're so blessed, Pastor. Where do I find a wife like Pastor Erica? You won't. There's only one of me, thank God. And do you know what? Some of you guys, you need to get it into your head. I've been married for 41 years. This isn't how I was. So stop looking for girls to start at the beginning. I've been married for 41 years. I'm 59. Stop it's not fair. It's not fair to compare other women with me. That's wrong. And you do me a disservice. It's not right. Can you say amen? So can you do me a favor, guys? Stop doing that. The young girls have got much to learn. Sorry, I'm falling apart totally. The young girls have ways to learn. I didn't know how to cook at the beginning. I didn't know. How, I learned in my journey. I learned to be the wife I am today. God taught me. I didn't get here overnight. Stop looking for the perfection before you've even begun. That's unrealistic. You good? Amen. Amen. That's why you're, you're, all so, you're still single. <laughs> There's no, no one arrives. No one arrives. And you know the beauty of, one of the things that makes our marriage as strong as it is, is we grew together. We grew together, we saw each other's faults and we worked out our differences together. And in the process of, I had a temper. I never took nonsense. Thank God for Jesus. But we grew together. We learned to die to ourselves. And in the process of the things we went through, our marriage got stronger and stronger and stronger. So don't look at the end product. It's a journey. And you have to make your own. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So take a leap of faith and trust God. All you need is to know that's the one God has for me. That's all you need to know at that stage. One day at a time, God will reveal. Nothing happens until you step out in faith. If you're waiting to guarantees and to see this, to see that, nothing's going to happen. You'll still be here 10 years from now. Take a step of faith. Can you say amen? How many brothers that are single have the gift? You know what the gift is, what Paul had. You don't look at women. I don't see one hand, Pastor. Is that one hand there? Is that a child? 
Who's got their hand down? You're, how many men in here that are single? Put your hand up. I want to say single men. Single. Don't be scared. I'm not going to do anything. Put your hand up. You're single and you know you're a man and you're not attracted to other men. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, how many of you have got the gift to stay celibate? To stay celibate for the rest of your life? I can release my faith with yours. My faith is strong to keep you single. You want to stay single? No? Okay. But you know what? I believe most, I, I think there's some people in this room under the sound of my voice. God already showed you. You just need to trust God and, and find that place of peace. You already have the peace. And usually, well, all the time, that person will have the same knowing. And it'll just be a confirmation. If they're like running you off, you missed it. But if, they, if, there's, a, if, if, if there's that connection, take the next step of faith. Trust God. Can you say amen? Bow your heads with me today. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for... Holy Spirit, for revealing your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for loving us enough to speak to the truth to us. Thank you for the truth that was spoken to your people in love because you desire change in our lives. And I pray that each one of us heard what the Spirit of God spoke into our spirits today. And we'll not just be hearers, but we'll be doers. Each one of us heard what the Holy Spirit, what you needed us to hear. And I pray that you will help us to walk out this word this week. Help us to grow in the character of our Father God. Help us not to remain the same. And for even those who have got stuck, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll help us to come out of that place and we begin to grow again. In Jesus' name. While every head's bowed, I just want to give everyone an opportunity here today. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, I want you to know that God loves you so very much. And that was His biggest gift. God loved us so much that He gave. He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, an innocent God, a spotless, spotless Saviour. He gave Him to pay for us basically to pay for our sins that's what Jesus did he went to the cross and he done time he took the punishment that was justly and rightfully ours and he said I will take their punishment for them for the Bible says for the wages of sin is death spiritual death and there was a separation that Jesus had to go through a spiritual death separation from the father so that he could redeem us back to the Father. He did all of that because he loves us. Now I want you to know today that the price has been paid for you. The prison door is open and all your sins have been paid for. And the, the way that you accept is to respond to the prayer of salvation. The Bible says it this way, it says, if you come, if you confess me with your mouth and believe on me with all of your heart, you shall be saved. He'll not turn you away. It doesn't matter what you've done. The Father will not turn you away. So if you're here today, I want you to know God loves you so much. And he wants to reveal his will, his plan and his love in your life. And all you have to do is pray. It's that simple. He did the hard work and he made it easy for us to come to him. So if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior, I want you to know that you can pray with us today. Can I just ask you to raise your hands if you want me to pray with you right where you are? We, you don't have to even pray by yourself. Every person in this room is going to pray this prayer with you. You've never prayed that prayer. You've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins and you'd like to pray that today. 
just this is just for me and you to acknowledge that you want me to pray I just wanted you to acknowledge that you want me to pray with you today is there anyone before we close today hallelujah can we pray this prayer together say with me Father God in the name of Jesus Christ I repent of my sins Jesus I invite you to come into my heart to be my Lord and to be my Savior from this day forward in Jesus name amen amen this is Omon he's got a Bible for you and we just want to have a time of fellowship with you and just provide you with some refreshments Omon will be here at the front after the service please don't leave without coming to see him he'll be standing right here amen God bless you today